G'day guys, just a few more tests on the new Dark OS on our R36S Panel 4 variant. If you were wondering, I was not able to get it working on my K36 clone variant. I did try a bunch of different methods, but we'll go over that in a bit more detail at the end of the video. I had a few people asking if you could use two SD cards on this new Dark OS, and the answer is sort of. I just formatted a spare 16 gig SD card I had laying around to FAT32, popped it in the second SD slot and powered it back on. And at the moment on SD1, I have no NES, SNES or Game Boy games. If we just scroll through the systems, you can see none of them are showing up. I have put them on SD2 though. So if we press start, go down to options, advanced, go down to the very bottom. You can see it says switch to SD2 for ROMs. Press OK on that one. Give it a second. It's also worth mentioning, it does seem to copy all of your ports over to the second SD card, but none of the other systems. I thought that was a little bit interesting. Once it's finished, it should automatically refresh Emulation Station. And as you can see, we now have our NES, SNES, and our Game Boy games. So it is currently looking for ROMs on the second SD card only. If we press Start, go back into Options, Advanced, go down to the very bottom. Unfortunately, there is no SD1 and SD2 option. So you can't split your ROMs between the two SD cards like you could in ArcOS. You're stuck with either reading ROMs from SD1 or SD2. It's also worth mentioning that DOS games don't seem to show up if they're copied to SD2. They only show up on SD1. That's probably not a deal breaker for most, I just thought it was worth mentioning. So in previous videos, we have tried some higher end systems like PSP, Dreamcast and N64. But what about all of the lower end systems? I think it is worth testing them as well, just to see if they do still work. We'll start with NES, we just got Mega Man 2. Again, it did load almost instantly and it does work perfectly. I think it's also worth seeing if save states work with SD2. Yep, sure enough they do. Some clones have issues with save states when using two SD cards. Thankfully, no issues here in Dark OS. We'll quit out of this one. We'll try some Super Nintendo, we just got DKC2. And sure enough, it worked perfectly, just as you would expect. Next up, Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Since they both do use the same core, I think we'll just start with Game Boy Color. It's got Pokemon Crystal, we'll load my save state. And sure enough, that works perfectly as well. See if fast forward works. And yep, fast forward also works. Game Boy Advanced, we just got DKC1. We'll try load our state. And save states do work still. Once again, no issues with GBA. The last lower end system we'll try is PS1. We've just got Crash Bandicoot 2. So out of the box, PS1 does not work. We load the game, shows ArcOS, black screen briefly, ArcOS again, and back to the PS1 menu. It seems to be an issue with the RetroArch 32 core. So if we press start, go down to emulator settings, go down to PS1 or just PlayStation, select emulator, the top option, change that to just RetroArch, exit back to the PlayStation menu, and if we load it again, it should just work. Sure enough, it has loaded. I have created a save state, so we'll see if we can load it. And it loads it almost instantly. And Crash Bandicoot 1 also seems to work perfectly. As long as you change the default core once, you shouldn't have any issues with PS1. At least in all the games I've tested. Now back into some harder to run ones. We've got Sega Saturn here. I've just got Snatcher. It is the original Japanese version. It seems to be working, but it did take a little bit longer to load, maybe six or seven seconds. So not quite as fast as all of the other systems we've tried, but Sega Saturn is famously hard to emulate. Might turn the sound up for this one, just so we can hear the voice acting. So Snatcher seems to play fine, at least the start of it. If we press select, it brings up the Sega Saturn emulator settings. If we go down to toggle FPS, yeah, we can see it's running perfectly fine. We'll go back into the short cutscene if we can. Yeah, even during the full motion video, it does stay rock solid 60. Obviously not all Saturn games are going to run this well, but at least we know Snatcher does run. Next up, we've got another Dreamcast game. Someone asked if we could try Power Stone on the last video. So here it is here. It loaded almost instantly, which is good. We are still using 100% stock settings, except we have changed the internal resolution back to 640x480. So the person that requested this one asked if I could try a 4 player battle. Unfortunately, I have no idea how to do that. We just go to arcade mode. It does default to one on one. So far, it does seem to be running perfectly though. Absolutely no slowdowns whatsoever. And yeah, this one runs absolutely perfectly. I'm terrible at it, but uh, no slowdowns or lag. The sound is also running at full speed. No crackling or any stuttering like that. 
I'll quickly swap back to SD1. There we go. Just so we can try out Crazy Taxi 1 again, except this time with the audio on. In the last video, I did have the sound muted just to avoid copyright, but a viewer mentioned that it does normally stutter quite a bit and crackle. So it'll be interesting to see if it still does that with Dark OS. So far, the sound works perfectly. And I can confirm that the music and audio is playing flawlessly. Absolutely no stuttering or crackling whatsoever. So as mentioned earlier, MS-DOS games don't seem to show up when running from SD2. I have no idea why. I did copy the exact same games over, but they just don't show up. We are back on SD1, and they do show up again. I mentioned in the last video wanting to try Windows 95 on this new Dark OS to see how much better it runs. Just got it here. The steps to getting it working are exactly the same as on Arc OS. So, so far it seems about the same. The startup chime is a little bit laggy. We do have to change it to mouse mode. So open up RetroArch, go down to controls, port one, device, mouse with left analog, go back, go to core options, input, mouse sensitivity. We'll change that down to maybe 40% and we'll close out of the RetroArch menu. We've got mouse working now. It's a little bit slow. I think we'll change the emulated CPU. So back into RetroArch. Go back, go down to performance, emulator performance. It's currently on 386DX. I think 286, 12.5 meg from 1985 might be the sweet spot. So we'll select that, close out of RetroArch. It's a lot smoother now. Does seem to be running much, much better. I didn't copy any games over. This is just the base Windows 95 install. Solitaire seems fine at least. It's a little bit laggy when dragging. That's not too bad. I close out of this and I'll see how well music plays. Go to C drive, Windows. It was a little bit bright. Hopefully you can see it now. It is a little bit slow to load, but once it loads, it does seem to play perfectly. So if we can skip around. Oh, it is loading a second instance. We don't want that. It looks like Windows 95 performance through DOSBox is pretty similar to Arc OS. I would still be interested in trying out some harder to run Windows 95 games in a future video though. I also wanted to try out the built-in video player, so I copied a few video files to the videos folder on both SD1 and SD2, but unfortunately no video option pops up on the main systems menu when reading from SD1 or SD2. It looks like there's no built-in video player, at least on the initial build of Dark OS. We could obviously install one through Portmaster though. I do want to try my original N64 controller using this USB adapter as well. I have made a video on this in the past for Arc OS, but I think it'll be really cool if it works in Dark OS just because of how well N64 games actually run on this. So I've plugged it into the OTG port. We'll start by going to Options, Advanced, and Controller Tester. See if it shows up here. Yep, it looks like it is detected. So that's good. We'll load up an N64 game and see if we can remap the controls in RetroArch. We did briefly get a pop-up saying USB gamepad not configured. And it isn't out of the box, that's fine. Bring up RetroArch. From here, press B, go down to settings, go down to input, go down to maximum users, change that to two. Go back up to RetroPad binds. We want to change port two controls, device index. I'm using port two on my USB adapter. So we'll go port two, go all the way back to the main menu, go up to quick menu, controls, port two controls, mapped port, change that to one. And that should be pretty much it. I'm pretty sure our gamepad should be working out of the box. We'll close the RetroArch menu just to make sure. So it doesn't seem to be working at the moment, but I'm wondering if I'm using the wrong port on my USB adapter. Unfortunately, it's not working. I might quit out of the game completely. I'll also restart the system with the controller attached, although that shouldn't matter since it was detected. And we'll try again. So I've been messing around with it for around 15 minutes now, and I just can't seem to get the N64 controller working in this N64 emulator. We might quit out, and I'll see if I can get it working in a different emulator. I might swap to SD2 just for our NES game. So we're back on SD2. We'll open up our Mega Man 2 NES game. Open the RetroArch settings. It does say not configured once more. So it is definitely detected. Go back to the main menu, go down to settings, input, two users, go up to RetroPad binds, port two. I'll change it back to port two on the USB adapter. Although that shouldn't matter since I can just swap the port around. And I did try that, it didn't help. We'll leave everything else as default, go back to the main menu, quick menu, controls, port two controls, mapped port one, and we'll see if that works. Now, nah, unfortunately, just can't get my USB gamepad working. That is a bit of a shame. Just to clarify, these exact steps work perfectly fine on the latest versions of ArcOS. 
a viewer also asked if I could try Pokemon Stadium 1 on this. And I remember the main issue being the graphical glitches with ArcOS. And obviously they won't be fixed since we are still using these same graphics plugins. But we'll try it anyway. So the cutscene's nice and smooth, that's good. Main menu looks okay, but unfortunately, right after here, there's the start of the graphical glitches. It does still work, it's just a lot of the sprites are all mixed up. You can't see the logos because they're all scrambled, but you can still read the text. We'll just go to the main one. This screen's not too bad. I think we should try mini games since that's the most popular thing in Pokemon Stadium 1. Let's pick a game. Unfortunately, that is a bit scrambled, but easy. This screen's not too bad. Might do Rock Harden. I remember playing hours of this back in the day. So this entire screen's all scrambled. We'll just press A to accept. Unfortunately, I press B. There we go, you have to press start. So the minigame itself runs perfectly fine. It's just a little bit scrambled in some menus. Can we quit out? We can. We'll try an actual battle though. Go to stadium. So this is all scrambled, but you can still read the writing, so not really a deal breaker. We'll just go Poke Cup level 50. Obviously no game pack, so we'll have to use the rentals. This screen seems perfectly fine as well. You can still see the Pokemon and all the writing's nice and clear. I guess we'll just pick uh, some random ones. Oh, so the info screen's a little bit scrambled with the uh, icon. It's up there spinning, but it should be here. Again, not really a deal breaker. It is still playable so far. A little bit of scramble on that screen. We'll pick some Pokemon. So far, this seems to be running full speed. It is just the graphical glitches. So the two character logos are a little bit scrambled again. That's fine. We'll go A battle. Hold down R. We'll go Toxic, which is C up. Yeah, this seems perfectly fine once you're in the actual game. I would say, although not perfect, it is definitely playable once you're actually in a battle. Or even the mini games, they were fine as well. We'll also try Pokemon Stadium 2, although I know that does actually run not too bad on ArcOS. So far it seems perfectly fine. I don't remember there being any graphical glitches with this one. A little bit of slowdown there, but not really too much. This screen doesn't seem quite right, but again, not really a deal breaker. I am using the stock graphics plugin, by the way, haven't changed any settings. See if we can go into an actual battle. The little Pokemon sprites missing. Again, not really a deal breaker. You can still see them on the main screen. No issues on this screen, which is good. You can see the junior trainer, I think it is. And obviously Ash is fine on the top left. Everything looks good here. A little bit of lag when it was first loading, but it's fine now. A little bit of graphical glitches here, but that's fine. We'll go Psybeam, see up. A little bit of lag again, but otherwise, yeah, seems fine. I would say Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2 are mostly playable. Not perfect, but definitely playable. So what about clones? If we power it on, we do get the flashing red light, which means it is not booting. I have tried a bunch of different methods to try and get this working on my K36 clone, including trying the Arc OS for clones DTP, which normally works on this handheld, mix and matching the boot.ini file, as well as the 12 meg image file. Unfortunately, no matter what I did, I was always getting the flashing red LED. The only thing I haven't tried doing is trying to copy the entire Linux partition from DarkOS over to a working ArcOS for Clones SD. Obviously replacing the ArcOS for Clones Linux partition. I'm still not sure if that would even work, but I'll probably end up trying that in the future. I think it's also worth mentioning I have been messing around with this same DarkOS install on the same SD card for the last few days. Trying heaps of different systems, changing a bunch of settings, including changing which SD card to read from, and I still haven't noticed any system instabilities. No freezes or crashes, and it always boots first time. I'll continue messing around with it, and I'll definitely do an update if I am able to get this to crash. I think that'll do it for today. If you have any questions or comments, let me know down below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.